Well, it is a privilege and an honor, as always, to be back sharing the Word of God with you. We are in Matthew chapter 4, as we study the book of Matthew in St. Louis Young Adults BSF. My name is Jacob Wearson. I am one of the substitute teaching leaders here at BSF in St. Louis. If you would, would you um, pray with me quickly as we dive into God's Word, as he prepares our heart for what um, he has in store for us as we read Matthew. Uh, Let me pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this privilege, this opportunity is to just read your word. Um, God, I pray that as we read about your temptation in the wilderness, Lord, as we read about the beginning of your public ministry, that we would remember the victory that we have in you. Lord, that we would be reminded of our identity. If we are blood-bought children of the King, that we are saved, we are born again, we are made new, we are righteous, we are holy, we have approval, we are justified on your behalf. Thank you so much, Lord, for your salvation that you've accomplished on the cross. God, I thank you for this time that you've given us, and I ask the Holy Spirit to open, prepare our hearts and minds. It's in your Son's name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, we are in Matthew chapter 4, and before we get into that, I want to make a note of something that happened last week, actually a week ago last week. Uh, and it was very fascinating, I thought. Um, if you did not notice that this took place, kudos to you, because it means that you have some self-control when it comes to social media. I, on the other hand, unfortunately did realize that this took place. So what am I talking about? It's this whole Facebook outage. Did you know that Facebook was out for six hours a week ago on Monday? And um, this meant that, obviously, Facebook, Instagram, Facebook Messenger, and WhatsApp and a couple other apps that Facebook manages were completely down. Um, this, of course, caused chaos. Uh, it's estimated that over 3.5 billion people use these apps. Uh, it created confusion. You know, what a mess, right, for the social media giant for Facebook. But I think this outage made me realize a couple things. First of all, it made me realize that I spend way much, too much time on Instagram. I just I waste a lot of time on Instagram. Um, Secondly, though, it made me realize that we get so much information every day from social media, right? We, there are hundreds, there are thousands of posts, on, of tweets, of pictures that we can access at any given moment on any of these apps. We are inundated with information on social media. It is absolutely information overload. It is overwhelming. Um, And I'm going to tie this into one of the main themes of tonight's lesson, which was overcoming temptation. Um, Temptation, by the way, is the definition. The definition of it is the desire to do something, especially something wrong or unwise. Um, And I think like the social media messages we receive daily, it sometimes can be incredibly overwhelming, right, with the temptations that we face. Whether it's sinful thoughts or actions or attitudes that can assault our heart at any given moment, um, we see in Matthew chapter 4 that Jesus himself faces temptations, right? One right after the other in the wilderness in Matthew chapter 4. And as with social media, where we need to fight to sift through the pieces of information that are just plain wrong, right? That we can discard because they're wrong or that lead us to feel angry or depressed or envious, we as Christians are called to fight, to find a way out of temptation, right? To find a way out of the lies that the enemy throws at us. Of course, scripture tells us that God provides that way out, that there is victory in temptation. So we're going to dive into that in Matthew chapter four. We're going to see how our unexpected King Jesus overcame temptation, uncovers the power of, of the word of God. So let's dive into that in Matthew chapter four. We have two divisions tonight. The first division is the power of God's word personally. That's in Matthew chapter four, verses one through 11, the first part of Matthew of this chapter. And then the second division is going to be the power of God's word publicly. And that is in Matthew chapter four, verses 12 through 25. So let's dive in here. This first division from Matthew chapter four, verses one through 11, the power of God's word personally. So let's take a couple steps back and remember what uh, we read in Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3 uh, documents the incredible encounter that we see with Jesus and John the Baptist. John the Baptist is preparing the way for Jesus. Jesus is actually baptized by John the Baptist. And this signal, the symbol, right, at the beginning of his public ministry, right before his public ministry takes place, which we are going to 
uh, read about in Matthew chapter in the latter half of Matthew chapter four. Um, Jesus receives affirmation from the Father, right in Matthew chapter four. Uh, remember what the Father says: "This is my Son, in whom I am well pleased." So there's this incredible experience taking place in Matthew three. But before we get to Jesus's public ministry, which we dive in in verses 12 through 25, um, we actually see Jesus is led to this difficult place. He is led in the wilderness by the spirit to be tempted by the devil. Those are the opening verses of Matthew chapter four. Now we need to, I think, be careful to note that Jesus was led by the spirit into the wilderness What does this mean? This means that there's a purpose to this. There's this purpose to Jesus being led to be being tempted, right? The father has a specific mission for the son in these moments. Um, Jesus is preparing for public ministry, but he's also going to get tempted to be tested. It's helpful too for us as the reader because we are seeing the Messiah revealed. We continue to see who Jesus is. He's our rescuer, our victory, What is his mission on this earth? We are reading about that too now, to defeat sin and death. And it shows us what's really happening in this world around us, that we live in this moral universe, that there is actually a cosmic battle taking place between good and evil. And by the way, if you haven't read Revelation yet, spoiler alert, Jesus wins and he he promises to come back and to rescue uh, the redeemed and the remnant. That's, a, that's a, a, a discussion for another time. Um, but there is this battle taking place between good and evil. Um, evil is real. Um, and evil is actually personified through a real spiritual creature named the devil, named Satan. Um, and this is this interaction that we are seeing, this experience taking place between the devil and Jesus. And I think this is another interesting side note um, that really these, these incredible interactions, these moments in scripture take place in the wilderness, right? A few other experiences that are significant that take place in the wilderness, or as I think of it, the desert, right? This form of isolation from everyone and everything. Um, Think back to first Kings where Elijah is running from for his life from uh, Jezebel and God meets Elijah in the wilderness. And we see this incredible discourse about God's faithfulness to Elijah and his rescue for the redeemed in Israel, for for the remnant. Uh, we read last year in Genesis where Hagar is carrying, uh, Ishmael's mother is fleeing to the wilderness and the desert when she is kicked out of the house um, by uh, Sarah. And she's all alone with her son in the wilderness and God takes, in his mercy, takes care of Hagar. Of course, uh, we see the Israelites in the desert, wandering in the desert. So bottom line, significant things take place in the wilderness through scripture. This time is no different. There is a purpose for Jesus as he begins his ministry, right before he begins his ministry, to being tempted in this moment. Uh, Verse two also tells us that this is a very vulnerable place for Jesus, right? Of course, he's isolated, he's alone, he's been led by the spirit, but he's also been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. We have to think of the physical and emotional exhaustion that this carries with this moment. Um, It's fascinating too, right? Because we are seeing this mystery of Jesus being fully God, the second person in the Trinity, Jesus, the son being fully God and fully man. He's identifying with our humanity in this moment. Um, And our lesson touched on that, but he's in a vulnerable spot. Um, He had hunger. He obviously had thirst. Um, I read online that you could survive for about two months without food. So Jesus is getting close to that point where he is at the, you know, he's at a very vulnerable place. He's absolutely tired and hungry. We can't even imagine that. And Satan wastes no time, right? Right away, Satan, the enemy of God, the enemy of our souls is tempting Jesus, So let's dive into each of these temptations. We're going to dive in. We're going to cover the temptation, and then we'll get into Jesus's response on the back half of this division. So the first temptation from verse three, Satan tells Jesus, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. I think that phraseology is very significant, right? If you are the son of God, 
the, the devil challenges the very identity of Jesus. He challenges, by default, the very nature of who God is. Um, I think this temptation is also very similar to the one we read in Genesis chapter 3, where Satan is tempting Eve in the garden. That lie at the core of that temptation, right? Did God really say it is meant to cause doubt and confusion in who God is and his character? Second temptation is similar from verses five through six. Scripture says, then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, the devil said, throw yourself down. And shortly after that, Satan uses Psalm 91 completely out of context and totally twists scripture. Now, Jesus has a response, as I mentioned, but I just think these first two temptations are interesting because they're similar in that their goal is to undermine the power of the word of God. It is putting God to the test. It's taking scripture out of context. It's twisting its meaning and purpose. And by the way, how often do we see that in today's culture? I mean, all you have to do is just open up your Twitter app and you just see, spending two minutes on Twitter, how easy it is to take scripture out of context and to confuse its meaning. So first two temptations are getting to the very identity of the Son of God. Uh, They're attacking who God is. Temptation 3, verses 8 through 9, reads like this from Matthew chapter 4, starting in verse 8. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you bow down and worship me. So no holds barred. Satan is throwing all the punches right here. He's just saying, look, You can have everything you want. You can have what you came for, which is to be king of this world. And you can have a suffering free life if you would just worship me. What I think is striking about this temptation is that it gets at the very heart of the mission of Christ. What what did Jesus come here to do, right? He came to save us, accomplish our salvation through his death on the cross And through his resurrection, this means, as we have read from Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah, uh, particularly in Isaiah, that the way of the Messiah, the life of the Messiah was to be marked by suffering. He was to go through loneliness, abandonment, and a brutal death to accomplish our salvation, to fulfill the will of God. And this temptation is a way out of that. It's a life free from suffering. It's a temptation that offered a life that was in strike contrast to God's mission and purpose for the redemption of the world, right? Just worship me, just worship me, the devil says. You'll get everything you've come to do. You will get the glory without the cross. And as I mentioned before, Jesus overcomes each of these temptations and he is not speechless when he's confronted by the devil. He responds with the word of God each time. So let's look at Jesus' responses. Temptation one, right? When the devil is tempting him to turn stones into bread, Jesus quotes Deuteronomy 8.3. And he says that man lives on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And by the way, could Jesus have turned those stones into bread? Of course, Jesus is God, right? He can do anything, but it was not his time. God moves according to his will, his timing, his purpose, not anyone else's. Second temptation. The devil is twisting scripture. He's testing God. And Jesus responds with Deuteronomy 6, 16, to not put the Lord your God to the test. Just shuts it down. Third temptation. When Satan is tempting Jesus with a life free from suffering, and a way to the to glory without the crucifixion, Jesus is quoting Deuteronomy 6.13, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. His mission was to glorify his father and to accomplish our salvation on the cross and through his resurrection. Do you see a pattern here to how Jesus is overcoming temptation? Um, obviously he's using, right, he's standing firm on the word of God. Does it cause you to rejoice in him as he lives the victorious life that we could never live? That he's faithful to, to the will of his father to save us from sin and death? This has to lead, I think, to our first principle, which is that victory over temptation comes when we look to Christ and his word. Victory over temptation comes when we look to Christ and his word. As I mentioned in the introduction, 
You know, we all face temptation, and those temptations can feel like those social media messages that we get, right? Thousands of times a day. Look at Jesus in Matthew chapter 4. He's in a vulnerable spot. He is tired. He is hungry. And he receives one temptation after the other. And I also think that the temptations of Jesus are a window into the lies and the temptations that we as believers face today from the enemy of our souls. So let's look into each one of those a little bit closer. Satan tempts Jesus, right, by trying to cast doubt on his identity as the son of God, right? If you are the son of God. He also twists scripture in these verses. When I think about this, I think about how the enemy assaults us just through life's circumstances. What do I mean? Well, let's, let's look at life's circumstances, the periods of life. Think back on the periods of life that you have gone through. Maybe look at what you are facing today. For example, we might be wrestling with something that we are facing every day. Maybe we're wrestling with our singleness. We are wrestling with our stage of life. Maybe we've been praying on something or waiting on something that God just has not delivered yet. Um, Maybe we're going through a painful period of our life that is marked by loneliness and depression, fear and pain. You know, these are ripe times when the enemy of our souls seeks to stir doubt and confusion about the character of God and the sufficiency of his word. In the final temptation, right, Satan is offering a suffering-free path to Jesus, a way to, the, to glory without the cross. This is cutting at the very heart of the gospel mission of Christ. How often, by the way, though, do we see this temptation manifested in multiple ways in our own lives? You know, perhaps it's through sexual temptation, right? Thinking that success, that sexual fulfillment is going to give us the happiness that we've been looking for. Maybe it's through the temptation of an easy life or money or a self-indulgent lifestyle that will provide the comfort and the security that we are desperately looking for. These are things that can assault us every day. They are powerful temptations and they can be frequent, but they are lies. And as children of God, we do not need to be overcome by them. We can have victory over them. So what do we do when we are faced with these temptations? How can we overcome? How can we find victory? Um, I think it's true, and it's, I mean, it is true. We are, our soul, there is a war being waged on our souls every day. But what's the answer? What do we do with this? We look to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. We look to the one who lived the life that we couldn't live. We look to the one who identifies with our humanity as Hebrews chapter two, verses 17 through 18 put it, right? The writer of Hebrews says, starting in verse 17 of chapter two, that Jesus stepped into, um, excuse me, the writer says, for this reason, he had to be made like them, fully human in every way in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people because he himself suffered when he was tempted. He is able to help those who are being tempted. He identified, we look to the one who identified in our humanity in every way. We look to him who died and rose again, which we're going to later read in the Gospel of Matthew, as he defeats sin's penalty and power once and for all. This idea of looking to Jesus, it's throughout the New Testament, like fixing our eyes on Jesus, right, is another phrase. Um, how do we do that? How do we look to Jesus? How do we fix our eyes on the Messiah? Well, one way, right, is obviously through his word, daily study of his word, encountering Christ in the Bible, reading through the book of Matthew, worshiping him in places and environments like church or Bible study, life-giving, gospel-centered friendships that encourage us to press on and to trust in Christ. So when we are faced with temptation, We can look to him, the victorious one, as we study the word. We're going to unpack that just a little bit more uh, as we dive in um, in, in, into our conclusion. Um, But for now, um, have that idea, have that thought in your brain, right? Fixing our eyes on Jesus. What does that look like? And let's dive into our second division and then move on to our conclusion. So our second division is the power of God's word publicly, Matthew chapter 4, verses 11 through 25. So verse 12 in Matthew 4, um, opens up with some troubling news. 
uh, John the Baptist has been put into prison. Um, Luke and Mark uh, provide more context in their Gospels. John actually had called out an inappropriate relationship with King Herod. Um, So John calls Herod out, and in Herod's pride and insecurity, he didn't like that, so he throws John into prison. Um, And then we read at this point that Jesus um, went to live in Capernaum, which was a seaside town, town, um, which was by a lake, actually, in Galilee. Uh, Jesus continues here to fulfill prophecy, particularly out of Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 through 2. And this is Jesus' message. He is picking up right where John the Baptist leaves off in verse 17, as Matthew chapter 4 says. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come. So he's stepping in to those prophecies, fulfilling those prophecies, and then he is living out his public ministry. You know, Jesus' mission was clear. Luke 19.10 tells us that the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. And that is exactly what he's doing in these verses. Further in this passage, we also see Jesus calling out his first disciples. And what I love about this, right, is that they are not the intellectuals or the well-educated. They are the common man. They are fishermen. Jesus says in verse 19, Come, follow me, and I will send you out to fish for people. Do you hear that call tonight? Do you hear Jesus calling you, come follow me from wherever you're at, wherever you're watching or listening to this? Do you hear him say, come follow me? And what I also think is an interesting nugget of truth here is where he starts his public ministry in Capernaum. Capernaum was not exactly a town that was thought of as being morally upright. Um, Capernaum Uh, Capernaum was actually a very diverse place with multiple religions and traditions intermixing with, excuse me, with um, the Jewish faith. Um, So it was, there were a lot of actually pagan religions and practices happening here. So for all intents and purposes, Capernaum was a spiritually dark place. Um, Lots of different pagan faiths coming into play here. But Jesus chose to start his public ministry here. He, he, cho- he chose to start his message here. And he chooses to call out his disciples to follow him, the common man, the ordinary person. Make no mistake, Jesus, <clears throat> excuse me, Jesus did not come to save the righteous or the morally upright or those that felt content in their own morality. He did not come for them. He came for the lost, for the spiritually dead, which, by the way, is all of us. And if you think you are too sinful for Jesus, or maybe you think you've taken a step so far back from Jesus that you can never come back, you are wrong. He came for you. He came to rescue you and me from sin. And what is the, I love the disciples' responses here, right? When Jesus says, come follow me, they drop everything to follow our unexpected king. Verses verses 23 through 25 demonstrate um, Jesus' compassion and love and mercy for humanity. He is teaching in the synagogues throughout Galilee. He is healing disease, human sickness. He is alleviating human suffering. Heals the demon-possessed, the paralyzed, and large crowds start to follow him, and word begins to spread about Jesus. So this is going to lead us to our last principle for today, and that is that God's word empowers people to follow him. God's word empowers people to follow him. So we have this amazing passage of scripture, right? We're studying the word of God. We're reading through Matthew chapter four. Uh, Maybe you had a great week of worship at your church or your faith community. You had um, you know, maybe you had an awesome week of just gospel-centered relationships and interactions. But here's the reality, right? We can feel pumped up and energized. Um, but as soon as we stop watching this video, as soon as we start listening to this message, the emotion, um, the adrenaline is going to wear off because that's what emotions do. They fluctuate. And maybe it'll be few days, maybe a few hours, maybe it'll be even a few minutes, but we're going to get bombarded 
with the temptations around us. I wish I could say that temptation stops when you start following Jesus, but the reality is in God's providence and sovereignty, he is saw fit to allow us to experience temptation. And we might be facing those continual temptations, wrestling with the stage of life that we're in. Maybe we're tempted to believe that God has abandoned us, that God has left us, that he is not good. It's amazing how at the core temptations can get to the very nature and character of God. Maybe it's that temptation to go back to that website, maybe to that thought or that fantasy that you know is wrong, but it tempts you with the lies that this will be satisfying. Again, like I said, I wish I wish with all my heart that we did not have to face these. But as, Jesus, as God saw it fit for us to still experience and face temptation, which, by the way, is not sin, he has saw fit that we have victory over temptation. We can have victory on this side of eternity. And that is the life-transforming truth here. So I said again, we look to Jesus. We're looking to Jesus who, in this passage we saw, experienced physical weakness. He experiences isolation, vulnerability, three temptations from Satan himself, and he overcomes each one of them by standing firm in the word of God. He was tempted to forsake the mission of the gospel, right? To live a suffering-free life. But instead, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame and sitting down at the right hand of the throne of God, as the writer of Hebrews tells us. We look to Jesus who, in his compassion and mercy for the world, begins his public ministry in a spiritually dark place in Capernaum, and he starts to alleviate human suffering in this unlikely place. That's his compassion. That's his mercy at work. All right, I promised you that we would unpack this idea of fixing our eyes on Jesus, on looking to Jesus. What does that mean? As I mentioned before, it it can mean a lot of different things. It can mean worship at a Bible, gospel-centered church through friendships, um, through gospel-centered friendships, through places like BSF. But how about this for a start, to make it simple? When we are confronted with our temptation, when you are tempted to disbelieve God or to buy into the lies and empty promises that the world throws at us, when you grow weary of this daily walk that God has called us to, will you simply cry out to him? Will you remember him, what Jesus has done for you at the cross and in his resurrection? Will you meet him in the morning before you start your day or at any point during the day? Read him in the book of Matthew. Read him in the word. Allow the spirit to speak to you through these pages in the Bible. Let's be willing to remember um, throughout this week that temptation has no real power. Sin and death have no real power because Jesus has accomplished our salvation and ultimate victory at the cross and in the empty tomb. And as we conclude, can you, as you're listening, as you're watching this, can you confidently say that you are a follower of Christ, that you have repented of your sin and surrendered your life over to Jesus? Um, if that, If you are answering that question honestly, and you might say, no, actually, I don't know if I am following Jesus. Can I just say that I am so, so happy, so blessed that you are listening and watching this message right now. But can I also say that if you don't know Jesus personally in a saving relationship with him, then sin sin still has the victory. Sin still has power because there is no freedom. There is no victory over sin without Jesus Christ. But that can change right now as you're watching this. I truly believe that it is no accident that you're watching this right now. If you're listening to this message, God has a reason, a reason for you to be listening to this message. Do you hear his call as he had his call for the disciples? Come to me. Come to me. Do you hear that tonight? Whether it's 
coming to him for the first time in faith or if it's overcoming temptation through study of the word of God, that all can start tonight when we come to him. So with that in mind, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer now as we conclude Matthew chapter four. And throughout this week, let's fix our eyes on Jesus, the son of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are, um, you are good. You are a good father. We thank you for sending us Jesus who steps in to this broken world as fully God and fully man and you rescue us from the sins and the temptations that we face. God, I pray for the believers listening to this, Lord, watching this, that they would find victory over temptation through this week, that they would encounter the living, resurrected Son of God, that they would realize the very res- the power, the very power that raised Jesus from the dead is actually residing in them now. Lord, would we realize that? Would we realize who we are in you, that we do have victory over sin and temptation? And Lord, for the unbeliever, the one who has not given their life over to Christ, God, I pray that they would trust in you today. Today is the day of salvation, that they wouldn't waste any moment, but God, that you would realize, help them realize of your mercy and your love and your compassion to them. God, we love you. We thank you for your word. We thank you that you are calling us to follow you in this walk of freedom. As we walk in obedience to you as overcoming temptation, but also resting in the identity that we have in your son. We pray all these things in his great name, King Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for listening. God bless you. Uh, We will see you next week as we dive in, start diving into Matthew chapter five. Have an awesome week. God bless.